Hey guys, James here with another H&K weapon review, and I'm excited because this week I'm going to be bringing you the USP series. Now, if you were coming to age in the early 90s like I was, the USP series may have been your introduction to H&K as a company. Uh, it certainly was their flagship handgun throughout that decade. And though I had exposure to other H&K weapons leading up to it, uh, I can still remember fondly coming home from the Citadel uh, for Christmas 1993 and receiving my first H&K handgun from my dad, a uh, USP-40. Um, others of you may remember this famous photo uh, taken in the fall of 1992 uh, for promotional purposes leading up to the release of the USP. Uh, it's of John Meyer, uh, then VP of Sales and Training for H&K USA in the black garb that uh, the H&K International Training Division was known for and it was used widely for uh, the marketing purposes by H&K themselves, but it was also picked up by uh, Red Storm Entertainment and used for uh, the cover photo for the famous uh, video game series Rainbow Six. But regardless of how you were introduced uh, to the USP series, even if it's here in this video today, uh, there's no denying the massive impact that it had, um, not just on the firearms community as a whole, when it was released, um, but for H&K as a company when they really needed it. Um, now my goal with this video, as it has been with all the ones that have preceded it, is to provide to you the definitive resource for these weapons. Um, unfortunately, quite often, not all the time, but quite often, uh, when you're searching YouTube as your, your source for specific firearms information, uh, what you find is limited best and at worst factually inaccurate uh, negatively biased. Um, heavy on flash and bang and light on real actual uh, informative information. Uh, so this will be a comprehensive review on the USP series from the history and design, uh, models and variants, um, operation, features, benefits, pros and cons, all from my experience as an H&K armorer, operator, instructor, um, but if you've seen my other video reviews, you will know that this won't be brief. Um, but if you stick with me, what you will find is it is the uh, most comprehensive video review you're going to find on these weapons. And regardless of how much you think you know about these, um, these great firearms, uh, I guarantee you're going to learn um, some more here today. So, with all that said, uh, I recommend you grab yourself a nice tasty beverage, find yourself a comfortable place to sit, and we'll dive right in. Now, to begin, uh, we have to take a look back at where H&K was as a company at the time and what external factors were at work influencing it. Uh, the 1980s had been really a banner decade for H&K. Uh, the company had grown significantly in size and stature, boasted primarily uh, by the successes of their G3 and the MP5 series. Uh, as long as, as well as other weapons, uh, with sales across the globe and a firm footprint here in the U.S. commercial, LE, and military markets. Um, but by the end of the decade, things were changing globally and uh, relating to sales for H&K as well. Uh, for the latter, uh, there had been a decision by NATO to standardize to the 5.56 millimeter cartridge, and that had forced just about every country to replace their 7.62 battle rifles with something of a lighter variety. Uh, but H&K did not really have an offering that was found to be a competitive solution uh, in that caliber. Uh, likewise, on the handgun side, uh, by this point, the only offering H&K had uh, was their P7M8 and P7M13s. And as awesome these pistols are for concealed carry and law enforcement use, uh, they were just not a viable military option, and their price point was double or more uh, to what you could get another semi-auto Wonder 9 from a competitor company uh, at that time. So H&K had identified that if they wanted to remain a leading small arms manufacturer, they were going to need to be able to address these two current vulnerabilities. Um, on the rifle side, they thought they had their solution in the G11, uh, the revolutionary and futuristic caseless ammunition automatic rifle, uh, which the U.S. and German militaries uh, we're looking at as, a, as really a game changer uh, within the Cold War arsenal. Uh, but when the Berlin Wall came crashing down in November 1989, uh, followed by the collapse of the Soviet Union, that great foe no longer existed. 
and along with the challenges surrounding the reliable function of the G11, um, that program died as well. Uh, additionally, in the U.S. commercial market, with the advent of the assault weapons ban, overnight H&K saw their entire rifle line disappear. Uh, so with the losses in projected sales of those commercial rifles in that U.S. commercial market, and then being heavily overextended in their development um, and expected sales of the G11 program, the result was a buyout of the company in 1991 by Royal Ordnance, a division of British Aerospace. After uh, a purging of a huge amount of personnel, uh, both skilled labor and institutional knowledge, and restructuring and cutting away of what was seen by the new ownership as costly distractions, a new focus was, uh, was needed. And that focus was on finding a new series of products that would keep their production lines going and those products would need to be much more simple and cost effective uh, to be produced than had been in the past. Um, as such, there was a forced diversion from the earlier stamp steel construction and a mandate towards what we affectionately refer to as revolutionary space age polymer construction, otherwise known as the plastic fantastics. Um, and knowing that there is no greater target rich environment for sales of firearms than the US uh, civilian and LE market, um, and with only the P7 M series pistols in their catalog, uh, they chose to focus their initial efforts on the pistols for the Americans. Uh, so the designers reached out to the U.S. sales team uh, to find out what the demands were of these U.S. contracts for new service pistols um, that they were continually losing out to. Um, and prime among these was an affection for the tried and true Browning short recoil operating system which uh, appealed greatly to the H&K designers as this uh, system proved simple, reliable, and cost-effective to produce. Uh, from there, they set out to maximize the modularity uh, to create a pistol that could be modified to the desires of the shooter. Uh, thus, what came to be termed the USP, or Universal Self-Loading Pistol, was jokingly uh, referred to initially with an Oberndorf as uh, the US Pistol. Uh, the most significant contract associated with uh, USP design was the intended submission for the FBI's 10 millimeter service contract uh, that was going on at the same time, uh, but their selection was completed before the USP uh, pistol could be uh, done. And by the time the USP was ready for, uh, uh, for release, uh, the 10 millimeter cartridge was out and the new 40 Smith & Wesson was the, uh, was the new hot cartridge. Um, so what you had for the USP was uh, a testing and development period that ran for about three years and was done in concert with what would become the Mark 23 uh, for the U.S. SOCOM Offensive Handgun Weapon System Program. Uh, with this, a wide variety of incredibly challenging uh, tests were conducted to ensure that the new design was reliable in the most extreme conditions. Uh, this consisted of exposure to cold, where the pistol was frozen, then fired, then frozen again, and with the uh, process continually repeated. Um, next came extensive testing in mud, sand, and salt water, all without negative results. Uh, initial firing tests ran uh, 10,000 rounds without a single stoppage. And then endurance testing with the uh, powerful 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge was conducted to 20,000 rounds, again without a single stoppage. Uh, NATO drop tests were next uh, with all drops on the uh, six points of the pistol, all within the uh, test range spec. Uh, then finally, to prove uh, the strength and accuracy of the barrel, uh, a bullet was lodged 30 millimeters before the muzzle of the barrel, and then another 40 Smith & Wesson bullet was fired to dislodge it. Uh, the barrel did bulge, um, but it didn't rupture. And, uh, and after the, the round was removed, uh, 10 more rounds were loaded and fired at a bullseye target 25 meters away, uh, all within a dispersion of 60 millimeters, uh, which even today is an incredible feat uh, for any pistol design. Um, and the results of all this extensive testing led to the finalization of the design in late 1992. Uh, released at SHOT Show in uh, January 1993, the new H&K USP was offered in 40 Smith & Wesson, and that was followed soon after uh, by the 9mm, and both were an immediate success. Um, so let's start 
with the USP40, uh, which you can see here on this stand, as well as this uh, cutaway training model I have, and a few other rare examples. Um, and we'll go through the design features of the USP series. The heart of the USP, uh, like all H&K weapons, is the barrel. Um, if there's one thing that H&K does best, it's making the highest quality, longest lasting barrels. And uh, for the pistol line, these barrels come in as blanks uh, where they are then inspected, uh, deep drilled, and then mandrels are inserted with either polygonal or conventional lands and grooves. Uh, initially, the USP was offered with lands and grooves, uh, but before the second year of production was completed, that was changed to polygonal rifling. Uh, then uh, nine barrels at a time are placed into uh, one of the cold hammer forging machines where four hammers take action, uh, imparting 140 tons of pressure per beat and 1,000 beats per minute. And here you can see uh, two crates of barrel blanks as they are ready to be placed into the press. And here you can see a representative from H&K Germany there on the factory floor holding two uh, items in his hand. Uh, on the left, you can see the shorter, fatter section, which is the barrel blank before it enters the hammer press. And on the right, you can see the thinner and longer section, which is the finished product um, pressed to an increased length. This is then cut to create five new barrels. Um, and then as you can see here, this is a USP compact barrel, uh, which has uh, just completed the uh, forging process and then been cut. And this larger area here at the rear um, is actually the chamber area, which is yet to be milled. But if you look inside here, you can see the polygonal rifling uh, inside the barrel. Pretty neat little um, memorabilia piece I've got. Um, and here, again, from the factory floor, uh, you can see an HK representative holding a completed barrel uh, with the chamber cut and ready to be finished. Um, and have that, uh, that finish applied to the, uh, to the barrel. Uh, the slides are milled as well. Uh, they're done three at a time from a solid block of steel. And as a cost savings measure, uh, the scraps um, that are made in this process are then uh, sold back to the steel company uh, for use in, uh, in future um, purchases. Um, here you can see a chart from the factory wall uh, showing the process or the progress I should say of the slides through the production process um, and then a rack of slides uh, in the process of being completed and as you can see here uh, I'm very lucky to have three USP compact slides that represent um, these phases of production uh, the first one you can see here is fresh from those initial cuts um, so what you have are the very sharp angles um, of uh, the slide, the rear section, and you can see just very briefly the initial cuts uh, into the inside. Uh, the next phase, uh, they'll actually cut the tang portion here for the recoil rod assembly, um, the front for the barrel, they'll cut the top for the ejection port, the two holes for the uh, extractor uh, roll pin and the firing pin assembly roll pin. Uh, the back section for the hammer, you can see the firing pin tunnel has been, been cut um, you've got the slide rails uh, now and there, the lightning cuts on the inside, the beginning of the breech face with the hole for the uh, firing pin assembly, uh, for, I'm sorry, for the firing pin to protrude through. Um, so we're getting much closer to the end. And then the final pass is here. You can see now we're getting much more into the, uh, the final product. We've got the dovetail front and rear, the sights, we've got the slide serrations, um, and now everything's really finished off in the inside. Um, so those, those are the processes that uh, will be carried out in order to uh, create each one of the slides. Uh, here we have a photo of the final stage of assembly uh, where we can see the slides that have already had their sights mounted. Uh, their extractors and firing pin assemblies have been installed uh, and they're being met with their barrels and their recoil uh, spring rod assemblies. Uh, these slide assemblies are then mounted to their receivers and that odd shaped assembly you see sitting on the table there is the trigger gauge. Uh, it has a rounded brass tip, uh, which fits over the trigger of each pistol. And then at the base, uh, there is one fixed and one removable weight. Um, this gauge is used to text, uh, test the uh, maximum, minimum, 
acceptable trigger pull weights um, of each pistol. Um, so uh, with the uh, with each pistol um, set with this uh, text fixture, uh, that gauge uh, with both weights attached is placed over the trigger and then the tr uh, pulled to the rear. Uh, the first test confirms a double action standard. Uh, then removing one of those weight sections um, from the gauge and cocking the hammer, the test is repeated to confirm the uh, single action trigger pull uh, standard. Um, and in this photo, we can see a group of USPs that are complete with uh, their build process and they're on their way to the test firing proofing section. And now we have to remember that at the time the USP was being developed, most of the other companies offering 40 Smith & Wesson pistols were modifying their pistols originally designed around <clears throat> the less powerful 9mm cartridge. Uh, in order to keep those dimensions the same and reduce their overall cost, those companies tried to make the 40 work within those tighter confines. Uh, unfortunately, as time has shown, often that resulted in reliability issues with those pistols, as well as stra uh, stress fractures in the uh, slides and receivers. Uh, but H&K designers uh, had learned that lesson before uh, when they had tried to adapt the P9S 9mm to accommodate the more powerful 45 ACP cartridge. Uh, and with the USP being a brand new design, they were able to approach this task uh, in really a correct uh, form. Uh, <clears throat> by basing the design of the USP around the 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge, it was easier then to modify it to work reliably with the less powerful 9mm cartridge. And uh, between these two types, uh, the receiver is the same on the USP-9 as it is the 40. Uh, but since the mass of the slide is key to the safe function of a recoil-operated pistol, uh, the slides are what is different. Uh, in order to reduce the mass of the slide in the 9mm models, what you'll notice is um, they, they both have a lightning cut, is what it's called there at the front, um, but in the 9mm one, what you'll notice is a reduction of mass here on the right side of the uh, firing pin tunnel, or actually the left side if it's flipped over, whereas on the 40, uh, you'll notice that that is all filled in here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, now is a good time to point out one of the interesting design features, which is uh, the incorporation of a relief port just behind the bre breech face. Uh, so if you look here, We'll see different holes uh, for other parts. It's this um, relief vent uh, that I'm talking about right here, just behind where the firing pin protrudes out of the breech face in the firing pin uh, channel. And this is uh, was created to help prevent gunk from building up inside the firing pin channel. And as, uh, as that happens and the firing pin continues to beat forward, uh, what you'll have is, is it actually can create a wall of gunk that uh, will seal up uh, that opening. And now with this relief valve, with the heavy impulses of recoil hitting the back of it, it'll actually cause that gunk um, um, to fall out there. And that's mainly caused by poor quality ammunition and lacquered bullets. Uh, what's noticeable though, is that it was not on the original uh, USPs. You can see it's absent here. It didn't come into later uh, in their production was it introduced, um, but it was actually introduced back in the 80s with the P7M8 and M13 pistols. And since the USP, it's been carried over to uh, all their succeeding pistols, as well as um, uh, some of their rifles as well. Um, so it's a neat, neat little design feature that most people don't even think about. Um, as reinforcement in key stress areas, uh, laser hardening was placed in two uh, specific areas. Well, you guys will be able to see this with the light, but um, right here on the bottom edge of the ejection port where the barrel actually locks up uh, with the slide, uh, it is laser hardened. So if you look closely at your slide, you'll notice a, a silver area um, there. The other, the other area is right here at the back of the firing pin tunnel uh, where the hammer makes contact uh, with the firing pin and that just gives it a little bit more rigidity. Um, and prevents uh, any cracking or chipping of, uh, of the slide areas. Uh, finally, 
the extremely tough finishes applied, and that's a nitrocarburization process where heat is applied with the finish while oxygen is injected to aid in providing a better seal. Um, and HK calls this their hostile environment finish. Uh, now, on this pistol, this USP is really a well used and, and, a, and appreciated one, so the finish is a little more worn. Um, you know, on this uh, cutaway example, which obviously is not fired, um, you know, it's, it's a much darker uh, color, um, but really very strong. These, uh, their finishes resist um, uh, corrosion and abrasion uh, pretty well and compared to a lot of the other competitors. Uh, the receivers themselves are created in a process that's called uh, metal injection molding or MIM, uh, in which uh, polymer pellets are poured into a clam-shaped mold. And uh, to add strength in key areas, uh, two steel inserts are uh, injected uh, just prior to the mold um, uh, being poured. And you can see here in the rear section of this cutaway, this metal portion here for the fire control assembly that extends as well to in, uh, contain the ejector. And then the other one is the locking block area, which we can see here, that extends to contain also the serial number plate. So those are the two sections of uh, metal uh, that are injected into each one of the, uh, the molds. Uh, groundbreaking at the time, uh, this was also the first pistol uh, to be developed that had an accessory rail uh, for mounting lasers and lights. Um, and obviously that's commonplace now. It's hard to find a pistol that's um, you know, uh, offered today um, that doesn't have an accessory rail. Um, but it's really neat to see that this is once again an area that H&K pioneered this and one of the reasons why this was kind of set itself apart from the uh, competitors and really kind of made it a tactical gun um, at the time, especially for law enforcement teams. Um, today, what you'll most often see when people talk about the USP series is, is refer to it as being dated or they'll criticize the accessory rail as being proprietary um, and not accessible to a wide range of products. Um, that are available on the current market, um, but um, and that this design really predates the industry standard of a Picatinny uh, rail system. Um, but what I would encourage you to do instead is view this as retrospectively as being revolutionary for the time. Um, and uh, when you're the first guys to come out with something, there's nobody else to really uh, to really compare it to. And obviously, things will evolve. People will see things. They'll make things better, and, and obviously H&K has continued to do that as you see the updates of the accessory rail system through the P2000, the P3, the VP9 um, as it's continued to move on. Uh, the other key factor uh, I think that we should discuss relating to the accessory rail is that instead of trying to create a light themselves, uh, which can often be a costly and time-consuming distraction, H&K worked together with a separate company uh, which had a technical background in compact lights in order to create uh, the universal tactical light, uh, as you can see here. Okay, And this joint effort uh, had proved to be very successful and was also being pursued at the same time with the development of the Mark 23 and its LAM, or laser aiming man module. Um, as you can see here, uh, the light attaches to the accessory rail on a USP. Uh, through a, uh, a clamping action. Um, <clears throat> it um, is powered by two uh, CR123 batteries uh, that fit inside uh, this compartment here. Um, it had an on-off switch um, that could be activated to uh, prevent a negligent discharge of the light. And then it had three modes of action. Uh, what you'll notice here is this, this horizontal toggle switch um, on, the, on the bottom that moves from left to right. Now first, if the toggle is pivoted um, from the left to the right, uh, as, as you would with your support finger um, holding the, uh, the pistol there, um, it will actually engage a momentary on position for the light. And releasing pressure, as you can see, bounces that um, toggle back to the center off position. And then second, if the toggle is pivoted from the right to the left, it locks itself in this uh, constant on position, and it requires you to actually disengage it where it will return itself back to the uh, 
the center off position. And then third, as you can see here in this photo, uh, there was an accessory pressure pad uh, switch that was available as an accessory and can be attached to the grip, allowing the light to be activated and deactivated by the pressure of the support hand uh, pressing up against the grip. Um, even today, um, this remains a very impressive design. Uh, the main weakness um, being the fact that light technology continues to rapidly advance. Um, originally, uh, with this incandescent bulb um, that you see here, uh, you know, all of us who own this gun and, uh, and, and light combination, we really thought we owned the night. Um, but now, with similar size lights producing you know, 500 to 1,000 lumens via high output LED bulbs um, that we see today, um, putting one of these original uh, UTLs next to something like a Surefire X300 uh, during a low light training course, um, and uh, what you get is more akin to soft mood lighting, like a romantic fireside evening. Um, there was an LED uh, head upgrade that was available for the UTL, and if you can find that today, it's highly recommended uh, to adapt the UTL uh, closer to uh, current standards. Uh, but before moving on from the receiver, uh, let's take a look at a few of the original design features. Um, the first one you have, um, as you see here, with our cutaway, is a very large trigger guard. I mean, I can extend my finger all the way here and have plenty of room, and that was incorporated to ensure that the uh, pistol could be used whether the operator um, was wearing tactical gloves or, or heavier winter gloves. Uh, the slide release uh, here and the multifunction lever um, to the rear of it um, were both large and easy to actuate. Um, here you can see a photo of a very early prototype, uh, which is serial number 004, uh, with a rather crude looking multifunction lever, um, but that was quickly discarded for the model that we're all familiar with. Uh, for the magazine release, uh, you can see that they carried over from the paddle mag uh, design on both sides, ambidextrous use that had been pioneered with the P7 uh, M8 and M13. Um, it's easily accessible either with the shooter's thumb or with the support finger on the other side. Um, and, uh, and shown here is uh, we have the original design, which is, is rather small. Um, next to the larger variant um, that is offered as an accessory update, making magazine changes even easier. Uh, it's a highly recommended um, upgrade if you want to uh, get better purchase um, during your mag uh, reloads. Uh, the grip texture on the grips, as you can see on both sides, um, it's a key attribute to the USP design. Uh, the sides, they're rough, and I liken them kind of like a, a muted skateboard tape material. Um, but the front and the rear back strap, uh, that's a different texture entirely. It's very aggressive. Uh, I wouldn't call it painful at all, um, but when you get done firing it, um, it's going to leave an imprint on your fingers and palms um, that's um, going to remind you of being in your grandmother's kitchen gripping an old meat tenderizer. Um, again, it doesn't hurt, um, but it's definitely not going to slip out of your hands, that's for sure. Uh, moving to the bottom of the magazine well, uh, what you're going to notice here is a, uh, is a lanyard loop here at the back uh, that serves to hold the, uh, the hammer strut and hammer spring uh, in place. Um, and it also serves as a mag guide for reloads. So when I come up to do a reload, I can position the magazine, the rear of the magazine, there on that portion of the lanyard loop, and then push it into place uh, to seat the magazine. Uh, lastly, on either side of the base of the grip, uh, you'll notice that there is a, a recess, a half moon um, concave recess, and this allows the operator the additional purchase when attempting to, uh, to remove the magazines uh, if they were jammed in there for some reason. Uh, usually when I see this teaching a course, it's when we're doing a, a double feed uh, drill where one round's in the chamber, another round's being driven into the chamber by the uh, by the closing slide and that pinches the magazine in place so pressing the magazine release isn't enough to be able to reach up and having that little additional area of purchase for your thumb and forefinger really helps you grab those magazines out and a lot of the other guns at the time uh, didn't have that feature um, it's very helpful uh, for those kinds of uh, 
magazine removals. Okay, now let's cover the markings on the uh, pistols. Uh, first, we have the serial numbers. On the USP series, um, HK marks the serial number in three different places. Uh, you'll see it on the slide uh, here just above the uh, slide release. On the uh, right side, you'll see it on the barrel uh, just inside the ejection port. And then on the bottom, you'll see it on the uh, metal injected um, portion here at the, uh, at the bottom of the receiver. Okay. Um, in the late 1980s, H&K instituted a specific model designation serial number coding uh, system where the first two digits uh, or the first three digits of the serial number were standardized and assigned to specific weapon models. Uh, relating to the USP series, uh, what we have are the following. Uh, 22 uh, stood for the USP full size, uh, 40 Smith & Wesson variants, um, as you see here. It starts with a 22 dash serial number. Uh, USP uh, full size 9 millimeter variant started with a 24. Uh, the full size 45 variant started with a 25, as you can see here on this USP tactical. Um, then you had um, 26 being uh, the USP compact 40 Smith & Wesson variants, 27 being the USP compact 9 millimeter variants, 28 being the USP compact 357 variants, and 29 being the USP compact 45 variants. Uh, so if you're looking at a USP, and obviously you're going to you know, be able to tell the size, or you can even see the caliber written above it. If you know the serial number codes, that helps a lot. And, uh, and it's the kind of thing where, as I get these guns in all the time for service, um, um, when I'm logging them into the logbook, I can look at the serial number and tell what model uh, the weapon is just based off the serial number without actually seeing the caliber. Um, the official U.S. importation marking uh, if done by uh, H&K, is found at the bottom of the receiver. Um, so you can see on this early model um, USP, it, they actually inscribed it into the polymer on either side of the actual metal injection mold. As you can see, it says H&K Incorporated Sterling, Virginia, whereas later uh, they made a change and they made the actual um, metal portion larger and if I can zoom in close enough, you can see this one says HKI Columbus, Georgia. Um, so you'll always find that import marking there. Sometimes when the guns are brought in by another U.S. importer, you'll see it um, inscribed on the slide or somewhere else. Um, but if it's H&K's import, it'll be on the bottom there. Uh, next, you're going to see uh, the antler symbol. Uh, it's kind of hard to pick up on this worn one, but you can see it right there. It's a little clearer on this newer model right here, okay? And that is a proof marking that is struck upon completion of the test fire of the weapon to show that it has passed the required testing standards. Uh, Germany has six proof houses in the country, um, and the one that HK uses because of its geographic proximity is the Ohm proof house, which uh, uses the antler symbol as their marking. Uh, on a side note, uh, this doesn't mean that H every H&K weapon uh, has to leave the factory and then be transported down to the Ohm Proof House for testing. Instead, uh, they have a representative from the Ohm Proof House that works out of the HK factory and approves the striking of that stamp after verifying the performance. Uh, we'll touch on that testing more in a moment. Um, next, you're going to find uh, the two-letter date code. Uh, on, uh, on this pistol, you can see the two-letter date code is right here. It's KI, uh, and that represents the uh, year that the weapon was built, or more specifically, when it was proofed. Um, it's broken down uh, in the following way. Uh, A equals zero, B is one, C is two, D is three, E is four, F is five, G is six, H is seven, I is eight, and K is nine. Uh, J is maintained for proof house use uh, within the company. Um, so again, looking at this uh, KI date coded uh, USP using that date code, we can see that this one was manufactured in 1998. Um, then forward of the date code, um, as well as directly below on the receiver, you're gonna notice a small marking right here. 
and then right there. And then you'll also notice it over here on the barrel next to the serial number. And what that is is an eagle over an N. And that represents a quality control stamp signifying that these parts, the receiver, the slide, and the barrel, uh, were proofed using nitrocellulose or uh, modern gunpowder. Uh, the newer pistols, like this uh, USP Tactical, instead will have a CIP over N. You can see it as well, CIP over N, and again, CIP over N. Uh, and that is a, uh, an updated European standardization, uh, whereas previously each country was able to put their own uh, marking, um, but uh, Europe uh, changed that all to one standard, um, and it's placed in those same locations. And, I guess for some diehard H and K collectors, those eagle over ends uh, seem to be uh, more collectible uh, for that single reason, as, as silly as that may be. Uh, the caliber of the marking, um, as you can see, is obviously um, always going to be on the left side of the slide. It's also going to be on the right side of the barrel, um, right there in the ejection port as well. Okay, and then lastly. Uh, the H and K logo is engraved on the front of the slide, um, and over the years we've seen that change from an actual deep engraving uh, to a laser etching, uh, like you see here. Um, on the right side of the receiver, you'll see uh, the actual location of manufacture. This one here, Heckler and Koch GmbH, uh, made in Germany. Um, some of the newer model pistols will also have the additional code here of DE. That is not the date code, as we see the date code is up here uh, by the antler mark. Um, the DE actually is another um, firearms manufacturing requirement that has been placed on the guns that wasn't uh, initially on the, the weapons, but now is, and the DE uh, relates to the country of Germany uh, to show where that uh, manufacturer was originally uh, done. Um, and then lastly, uh, for markings on the bottom left side of the uh, the grip, you will see on the original guns, uh, they had H and K USP with uh, the USP in kind of a smaller font. And then on the right side, you would see the original US patent number. Uh, when these guns were updated later, in production, we saw that the H and K portion was removed, and now we just have one large script of USP, and it's actually on both sides. Um, and that's the same as on the full size and the compact and all the other model variants of, of the USP series. Um, back at the factory, um, once manufacturing is complete, each uh, USP fires 17 rounds. Uh, the first two are higher pressure cartridges used for proofing. Um, and as mentioned previously, um, they, uh, they are then uh, brought in to uh, a uh, actual uh, jig here and placed in there for the laser engraving process that you can see. Um, when complete, that uh, representative from the own proof house authorizes that proof stamp to be struck and those, those famous antlers are placed onto the, uh, the slide of the weapon. Uh, the remaining 15 rounds uh, are then fired. Um, that includes five for accuracy and 10 for reliability. Uh, for accuracy on the full size USP, four out of the five shots must uh, not exceed 4.8 inches at 25 meters, whereas the compact model, uh, that separation is allowed to be increased to 6.8 inches. Um, for those of you who wonder about what the hold is used when zeroing the USP at the factory. It's done with a six o'clock hold, um, point of aim, point of impact at 25 meters using a, a FMJ ammunition. Uh, side adjustments are made by the front and rear sights. Uh, changes in elevation are made by removing the front sight and exchanging it for either a taller or shorter sight. If you wanted to raise the point of impact, you would replace your front sight with a shorter sight. If you wanted to lower the point of impact, you would replace it with a taller sight. Uh, sights are offered in 0.2 millimeter increments, and uh, each change of 0.2 millimeters will affect the point of impact by approximately two inches at 25 meters. Uh, for windage changes, 
you simp uh, simply shift the rear sight in the direction you want the round to, uh, to strike. And then uh, sight heights on the front sights are generally inscribed on the underside of the sights. Um, but if you need to find out the height of your sight um, because that inscription is somehow omitted, uh, you simply measure the base of the sight to the top, as you can see here with this uh, micrometer. Uh, the industry standard uh, three dots dot sighting uh, system uh, was offered with all of the uh, USP series pistols. Um, that has since been upgraded with uh, the Luminous uh, dot sights. Um, as you can see here, which uh, have kind of a yellow look to them, and these will actually gather light for a certain period of time and hold it, um, but then die out. And then obviously uh, the updated sights um, that most people would want to get if you're planning to use this for carrier home defense would be your tritium sight options, uh, H&K in the U.S. uses uh, MEPR lights, and obviously the tritium uh, will hold uh, light for, for quite some time. Now uh, let's look at the operational design of the USP series. As mentioned previously, the USP uses the Browning Short Recoil or Tilting Barrel design. Uh, in this form, recoil energy is utilized to cycle the action of the pistol. So let me showcase uh, the eight-step cycle of operation with the USP. Uh, first, we have feeding. Uh, when a loaded magazine is inserted uh, into the uh, magazine well, and then either the slide is uh, released or manually cycled back, uh, what you'll have is engagement of the feed pole. And the feed pole is this, um, this raised section here that starts at the breech face and moves all the way back to the firing pin tunnel. And you'll notice it extends down further than the rest of the slide. And that actually fits uh, within the space between the two feed lips and it makes contact with the rear uh, of the uh, cartridge that's at the top of the magazine and as the slide uh, moves forward it'll strip that round off and start pushing it up the feed ramp um, uh, as it goes in towards the chamber. Um, the next thing that you have is the force of the cartridge um, being positioned to the chamber with the slide coming to rest as the chamber face forces the extractor uh, which you can see here, over the lip of that chamber cartridge. Um, and at this point, uh, you know, the weapon is going to be um, uh, completely chambered, or I'm sorry, the round is completely chambered, and the weapon itself is locked. Okay, And then when we have firing, uh, the pressures of um, the forces on that casing push back against the breech face. And then you'll see the slide and the barrel start to move forward. I'm sorry, move rearward. And uh, as it starts to move rearward, in those first few millimeters, um, the slide and the barrel move together um, that short distance. Okay, but at, um, at approximately three millimeters, where the projectile has left the barrel and the gas pressure has dropped to a safe lever, uh, level, uh, you'll see a lug shape on the underside of the barrel in the chamber. Uh, which you can see here in this picture, uh, and makes contact with the hooked end of the locking block on the end of the recoil uh, spring rod assembly. And then those contact forces unlock the weapon um, as the rear of the barrel drops down, uh, as we hence call it the tilting barrel design. Um, and that stops the barrel's rearward movement. And at that point, now just the slide is moving back to the rear. Um, as the slide uh, continues to move to the rear, that empty casing um, is met by the ejector. Okay, so what we can see here is um, the ejector in the slide, and it's, or I'm sorry, on the receiver, and it's on the left side of the receiver. And if we look down here, we can see that when the uh, slide goes back to the rear, that ejector moves through an opening here on the breech face and it will actually make contact with the left side of that casing, forcing the casing to pivot to the right. And that pivoting motion is, is uh, continually pushed on the extractor, which is also under spring tension to the right, and that will cause that casing to um, be fully removed from um, the uh, chamber, extracted, and then ejected out to the uh, right side of the shooter. Okay, uh, then as the slide continues to move back to the rear, 
we'll notice that the hammer is forced all the way down. And as the hammer is forced down, what happens is, uh, is it compresses the hammer strut and the hammer strut spring until um, the hammer is then locked by um, the sear. And we can see that here as the hammer moves back to the rear. It now is held in place by the sear at the base here. Then um, the, uh, the slide will begin moving forward again, completing that eight step cycle of operation and starting the process over again as it strips another round off, off the top of the magazine and begins the feeding and chambering process and so on for another shot. Uh, now let's focus on, I think, one of the most unique uh, features of the USP, and that's which was also a part of the Mark 23 design that was happening at the same time, and that's the recoil um, spring assembly, or in this case, what we call the dual recoil spring assembly. And what you can see here um, is in uh, most Browning tilting barrel designs, uh, they will use just one main spring over a recoil rod spring. Um, the longer mainspring here uh, that HK uh, incorporated with a smaller um, buffer spring below is what separates this uh, from other designs. Okay, The longer mainsprings engage during that initial stage of recoil, um, but it's the shorter, tighter uh, second stage uh, buffer spring that helps significantly reduce the energy imparted on the receiver during firing. Um, it's actually activated twice uh, during the eight-step cycle of operations. Um, uh, first, that um, the buffer spring uh, absorbs the initial unlocking blow of the barrel, decelerating the barrel's rearward movement. Um, and then during further recoil, that buffer spring is released. And then at the maximum rearward movement of the slide, it's compressed yet again, adding that additional um, force with the uh, mainspring to allow the uh, slide to go back into action. Uh, this unique dual recoil spring rod assembly uh, is, uh, is rated to reduce felt recoil by 30%, and it's insensitive to ammunition types. Um, that allows the USP to exceed sustained use of plus P or plus P ammunition, uh, which is, uh, again, pretty impressive for, uh, for the gun designs this time, especially when so many other companies were having problems with reliability and, and crackings. Um, safety is always a hallmark of the uh, Heckler & Koch weapons and uh, the USP, they raised the bar again with it. Um, there are eight safety measures uh, in place on the USP, so let me uh, go through those um, each in, uh, in sequence so that we can fully understand um, really kind of the principles around it. And I think you'll learn a bit um, here in this as well. Um, the first one, obviously, is the external safety. Okay. On this, we refer to this as a multifunction lever. As some people call it a safety lever. Um, you know, um, when the safety um, is actuated, you're actually not just moving, you know, this outer portion um, but you're moving an axle that moves all the way across uh, the weapon. It's called the hammer axle. So it holds the, the hammer uh, components in place. Okay. When it's engaged, there's a rounded portion on the hammer axle um, that prevents the forward movement of the trigger bar. And if we look inside this cutaway example, this is your trigger bar here. And just like, as we see here on this disassembled one, here's your trigger bar. It's the same there. So. If I've got my safety in, uh, in the on position and I try and pull the trigger, my trigger bar moves slightly forward, but it's blocked from the full movement um, because it's presented with a rounded portion on this hammer axle. But when I put the weapon on fire, um, there is now a cavity that rotates um, on that hammer axle, and that now allows the trigger bar the ability to move all the way forward and, and the, uh, the weapon to be fired. Um, so that, that's a neat feature, um, you know, not unlike other external safety designs that you will see on other guns, um, but that's obviously the most uh, obvious uh, safety feature. The next one is the disconnector. Okay. So if you look here at this, um, 
uh, disassembled uh, uh, receiver, it's this portion right here. So if I look down at all the components, I've got my sear axle that moves across here, and I have my disconnector uh, right here, this angled ramped portion. Now, if I look at my slide, I will notice that there is a cutout section here on the right side of the slide as well. Hopefully that comes in clear. And it's raised up above here, it's raised back there. And then that's where your disconnector um, sits in place. So the disconnector is under spring tension. Um, when it's at rest, um, inside that recess within the slide, um, it will allow the weapon to fire. I can pull the trigger, the hammer is going to fall, all that works, okay? Um, but when it's not at rest, and again, the whole purpose of the disconnector is to prevent out-of-battery fire, if I press down on this, um, the disconnector, now the trigger bar and the trigger still move, but what's happening is the trigger bar is out of contact with the sear activate, uh, actuator latch, so it's not able to drop the hammer. Again, preventing out-of-battery fire. Um, so it's a, it's a unique feature, which again relates to how this is positioned, meaning that out-of-battery would be that my slide was not fully uh, closed, the weapon's not locked. So if this is outside of this, uh, this area point, this recess area for the disconnector, it'll actually disengage the disconnector and, and now, it, now it won't work effectively. Um, and you'll see that same feature on just about every other um, handgun design as well. Um, it's, it's a key requirement um, for, uh, for design. Um, the next one is the firing pin uh, spring. You know, noticed here, nothing fancy. We see that on most guns as well. The firing pin spring is a, is a simple design, but it basically prevents um, the firing pin itself from making contact with um, the primer on a chambered cartridge um, just because there's an amount of resistance that has to be overcome. And that, that basically prevents you from just shaking the gun and having it go off. Um, so you've got a simple design like that um, incorporated on there. And then you have the firing pin block. Okay, so um, that is horizontally mounted within your slide. So if you look in your slide, and you'll notice this rounded section right here. And if I press on it, you'll feel it's under spring tension. It pops back up again. Okay, that's your firing pin block, and its design is to block, as the name suggests, the firing pin from being able to move forward in the firing pin channel, protruding out of the breech face and, and impacting um, the prime runner chamber cartridge. Okay, well, how does that work? Well, if you notice, I've got one disassembled here, and you will see that it is rounded at the base and at the top, and in the center, there's this cutout relief section like a C shape. And then if you look at the firing pin, you'll notice the firing pin is rounded on one side, but on this side you'll notice that there is also a relief section right here. And these two pieces will interface with each other. I don't know how well that shows, but they'll interface like this. Okay, at rest, when it's not pressed up against the spring, um, this portion, this rounded portion, is blocking um, the firing pin from moving forward. But when there's pressure against it, it now presents itself into this open uh, recess. Those two recesses meet each other, and now the firing pin can move back and forth freely. Okay, well, how does that work? How, does, how do you defeat the spring pressure? Well, you do that by the next piece, okay? And that is what we call the control lever. So we have the disconnector here, and now we have the control lever here, okay? When I pull the trigger and the weapon's um, on fire, what you're gonna notice is that the trigger bar starts to move forward. And you'll notice, again, how well you're gonna see this, the, uh, the control lever will start to pivot its way up. You also see this on the cutaway example. Hopefully the lighting will pull this in. This is your uh, trigger bar. And here is your control lever, and this rounded portion right there is your firing pin block. Now watch as I pull the trigger. You're going to notice the, the trigger bar moves forward, the control lever pivots up, and now you're going to see that firing pin block move up as well. Okay. 
And it's that motion that clears the firing pin block out of the firing pin channel. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the only way to have the firing pin channel cleared for the, for the firing pin to move forward is for the trigger to be pulled, right? Because um, if the trigger's not pulled, then um, this control lever can't push the block out of the way. Well, that means that the safety has to be off because if the safety's not off, um, the control lever is not going to push the firing pin block out of the way. So all these things have to be done. You have to defeat the external safety, you have to pull the trigger, and then the firing pin block can move, and then the control lever can move up. Uh, so that's the next feature. You can see how they start to work in concert with each other. Okay. Well, that brings us to um, the next safe safety feature, um, which works in concert with that as well. And that would be our, um, our catch, okay? And sometimes it's referred to as a sear actuator latch. Sometimes it's referred to as the drop safety. Um, but again, moving from right to, to left here, we have the disconnector, we have the control lever, which is this little dog leg section. And the next piece is right here, okay? It's this portion right here. Next to it is the sear, okay? And this is called the catch. Now, if I look at, let me find one of these here. To, uh, to grab for you, and I can showcase one more piece for you. Yep, here we go. Sorry, I didn't have all my things in here. This will make it easier to reference. If you look at the hammer here, okay, and we notice this is the portion that strikes the firing pin, we'll notice there's this cutout section right here in the hammer little open recess in the hammer here, okay? When the, uh, when the catch is at rest um, and the hammer is forward, okay, what you're gonna notice is that the catch impacts the hammer right here at this place. And that prevents the hammer from moving all the way forward and striking the firing pin. It can't make it all the way forward. So if I had the hammer cocked, Hit the, hit the decocker, the catch is what catches the hammer's forward movement. Now, if I pull the hammer back all the way to the rear again, and I look, there's that recess. Now, if I put the weapon on fire and I pull the trigger, just the same way that the control lever pivoted up when I pulled the trigger and the trigger bar pulled it forward, now you're gonna notice the back of the catch is going to move down. Do you see how it pivots down right here? Okay. And when it pivots down, it falls within that recess area that we showed you on the hammer, and that allows the hammer to fall all the way forward, far enough to actually impact the firing pin. Okay. At the same time, as this angle of the catch moves down and falls in that area, the other end of this thing, it, it's, it's shaped like this, the other end is it pivots down, pivots forward, and it actually rolls the bottom of the sear off of its intercept position with a notch, on the hammer, and that's what causes the hammer to fall forward. Uh, so it actually serves two purposes. One is a safety measure, the other, other one is a firing measure. Okay. Um, and again, that requires the trigger to be pulled. So you're not gonna be able to have the hammer fall and defeat the catch unless the trigger has been pulled as well. Um, And then uh, the next safety feature we have is the rubber insert on the hammer. Um, so I'll pull this one up again. You can see all of this is metal. And this section right here is a rubber insert that has been attached to the hammer. Um, and that's designed to both lighten the overall weight of the hammer, um, allowing for a lighter overall trigger pull, um, and dissipate the energy of the weapon if it's dropped on the hammer, uh, better surviving the drop test that I'll describe here shortly. Um, the next safety feature is the lockout device. Okay, the original USPs did not have this function. So you can see here this lanyard loop. Um, it is not present um, on, the, uh, on the weapon. The later model guns, like this one here, you will notice it is present. And you can see it right here, okay? Um, this uh, this safety feature for uh, 
obvious U.S. importation safety requirements um, was shipped with a small key, which uh, fit inside that lanyard loop, as you can see here in this picture. Uh, when engaged, uh, the lockout device prevents the compression of the hammer spring and strut, uh, that downward movement, and that way it prevents the hammer from being cocked. So whether you manually tr tried to reach back and, uh, and cock the hammer back, or you cycle the slide back to the rear, either way it wouldn't allow it because uh, that hammer strut spring is not able to compress because that lockout device is, has forced it in the up position. Okay, so those are your safety devices and I think before moving on I, I really need to just touch on the discussion uh, between the nomenclature for the control lever and the catch and that is because um, it is uh, it has caused confusion over time. Um, there's multiple roles that these parts fill, as we talked about. It can be a catch, it can be a uh, sear actuator latch, um, and, uh, and what you'll see in uh, parts diagrams and manuals over the years is that, um, that these things can be confused. Initially, as you can see here in this picture, the control lever and the catch were one piece, um, and they were later separated into two different pieces, so that started the initial confusion, um, and then again, as, pr as uh, production and manuals continued on, you'd see those parts changed. Uh, when you move to the P2000, P30, the name and culture, the nomenclature stays control lever and catch, but initially you'll see those names kind of be uh, mixed around. So you just have to be aware of that when you're looking to order these parts, you know, either online or, uh, or from H&K directly. Uh, sometimes it helps to send a picture and talk about exactly what you're uh, what you're referring to. Okay, uh, this is a good place to also discuss the the drop tests. Uh, those are a series of tests um, that are actually a requirement for three different entities, um, and they're tied heavily into being able to be competitive for LE contracts and military contracts. Um, the drop test involves um, taking a uh, empty casing and filling the casing with modeling clay. Um, and then inserting that casing into the chamber of a pistol. Uh, then the pistol is dropped six different times, uh, once on the magazine, once on the top, on the sights, um, once on the back, once on the front, once on each side. And after each drop, uh, that cartridge is removed and inspected to see if there's uh, any imp uh, imprinting of the firing pin on that clay in the position of the, uh, the primer cap. Uh, for the NIJ drop test, that test is conducted from a height of one meter and it's dropped onto a hard rubber plate. Uh, for the NATO drop test, it's conducted from 1.5 meters and dropped onto concrete. And then for the German TR drop test, uh, the height's raised to two meters and it's dropped on a steel plate. Um, so when you often hear people complain about why H&K does not offer lighter trigger pulls on their USPs and other pistols, well, the answer is because of those tests. Um, you know, these pistols are designed for military and law enforcement contracts first, and uh, in order to survive those tests, they found that reducing the trigger pull from less than about you know, four to three and a half pounds makes it very difficult for them to uh, pass those tests reliably. Okay, now let's look at the uh, modularity of the USP design, uh, which I think remains one of its primary advantages over um, the other models uh, from H&K and other companies uh, as well. Uh, shown here is an early presentation of the multiple variants of which a USP can be set up, uh, though conversion between these variants is considered an armorer level task uh, requiring multiple internal components to be swapped around. Uh, the modularity makes the USP series ideal for both left and right handed shooters and those looking to change the fire control operation of the pistol as their needs or desires uh, kind of adapt over time. Uh, the primary part which uh, results in the change of each variant is the detent plate. Uh, we can see the detent plate here as it's exposed um, with the slide removed. You can see how it pivots with the action of the multifunction lever. Um, there are three different versions that exist and they interface with that uh, that multifunction lever in order to provide the variations of the actions of safe, fire, and decock, or some modification of those three. Um, the standard variant offered for the USP is variant one, uh, which you can see this 
USP uh, cutaway model is set up for. Uh, variant one has the multifunction lever on the uh, left side of the receiver for a right-handed shooter. Um, as the markings on the uh, multifunction lever show, you have the position of S for safe and F for fire. It's not painted on this uh, model, but you can see it is painted here on the others where there's a white dash to let you know which setting you are on. Um, and this allows um, the pistols in variant one to be carried either with the safety on and the hammer down or the hammer back with the safety on in what we uh, generally consider as cocked and locked, you know, coming from a 1911 style background. Okay. Um, when you pivot the multifunction lever down and into the horizontal position where that F portion aligns with the white mark on the receiver, uh, the pistol's now in the fire position, allowing the weapon to be either fired in single action or uh, double action mode. Uh, then, if, you're, uh, if you press the multifunction lever all the way down to the bottom, what you will get is the decock function, where again, the hammer drops safely uh, because it is caught by the catch that we talked about before. And then what you'll notice is releasing tension on the multifunction lever positions it back up to um, the fire position so you can continue engaging if you want to. And what you'll notice through the, uh, the polymer here on this cutaway design is this piece right here. It actually looks kind of like a flag and it's called it a, uh, it's called a detent plate. No, uh, you know, slide plate is what it's called. And there's a spring here. And so when I pivot the uh, multifunction lever down, you'll notice that the slide plate moves down, it compresses that spring, and that allows um, the action of the detent plate to maneuver. And then when I release it, it forces that multifunction lever back up into its position again. Okay. Variant two uh, functions exactly the same way as variant one, except now the multifunction lever would be removed and replaced with another multifunction lever that is only on the right side, and that allows left-handed shooters to use the same gun. Okay. Uh, variants three and four were designed uh, for those who wanted a double action, single action pistol, but were not interest, uh, interested in an external safety. Uh, so what you'll notice there is that the uh, multifunction lever won't have the S and F markings. It'll just be black and it won't go up into a safe position. It'll just be um, allowed to uh, maneuver from fire down to decock and then move, maneuver itself back up to the fire position when released. And again, that is changed out by uh, it changing the multifunction lever itself, as well as the detent plate um, to have a different functionality to not allow the upward safety motion. Okay, and, and then in that case, the shooters would rely on you know, the heavy double action trigger pull um, to be their safety measure. Okay, uh, variant three has the uh, multifunction lever on the left side uh, for right-handed shooters and variant four has the multifunction lever on the right side for left-handed shooters. Um, variant five and six were designed for operators um, and who wanted a double action variant, but with an external safety. Um, so this concept focused on those departments uh, and agencies uh, and even commercial customers who were transitioning from uh, revolvers with their heavy double action triggers. Um, as such, that original design um, of these double action only was very heavy um, in the trigger pull with about 11 or 12 pound uh, range. Um, uh, in those variants, the detent plates changed out again, uh, shown here, as well as returned to the S and F marked um, multifunction levers, uh, but with a different model uh, than you saw in the variant one and two. Uh, engagement allows for the pistol to be placed on safe uh, with the hammer forward and then pivoted down to the firing position. Um, but as these are double action only variants and the hammer is changed out uh, for a model that doesn't have the secondary intercept notch, meaning it instead of having a single and a double action notch, it's just got one for double action. Um, there is no need for a, uh, for a decock function because um, it's gonna go back to uh, double action every time. Um, as you might expect, the variant five had the, the multifunction lever on the left side 
for right-handed shooter and variant six had it on the um, right side for left-handed shooter. Um, not a popular variant. I've only seen um, this um, variant during the uh, armor uh, course for H and K. Um, they just nobody nobody shoots a, a trigger that heavy anymore. Uh, variant seven is the double action only variant with no multifunction lever at all. Um, so that's where this is removed completely. Um, and again, not a popular option because of that heavy 11 to 12 pound trigger pull. Um, here you can see a, a photo of a very early uh, V7 model. Uh, later, um, with the introduction of the law enforcement modification or LEM trigger system, um, of which I've got a, a separate video that I highly recommend you go check out. Um, variants 5, 6, and 7 have been replaced with what we now know as either LEM light or LEM heavy. Uh, variant 8 uh, was mysteriously never presented by h and uh, I have no information whatsoever on what that is, um, as it was never released. Uh, and then finally, we have variant 9 and 10, and that represents a return to a double action, single action, with the use of a multifunction lever and the... Um, the detent plate from variant five and six. And the way uh, variant nine works is that the multifunction lever um, is on the left for right-handed shooters. Uh, the lever moves between safe and fire, uh, but there is no decock position, okay? Um, and then variant 10 uh, has the same exact functionality, um, but with the selector on the right side for left-handed shooters. And that would, again, be more akin to a 1911-style shooter who wants to carry cocked and locked, safety to fire, but there is no decock motion. Uh, so the downside of that would be the only way to then drop your hammer safely uh, um, would be to manually ride the hammer forward with the trigger or just always carrying cocked and locked and never worry about the hammer down. Uh, again, not a really popular option for uh, that obvious reason. Okay, with the design, operating principles, and variants covered, um, before moving on to the models that followed the USP-40 and 9, I need to discuss the magazines. Um, with these pistols, H and K diverted from every previous pistol they had made, and instead of offering them steel magazines, they chose to use uh, black polymer magazines instead. Um, the USP-9 was uh, provided with uh, 15 round magazines, while the 40, which you can see here, was uh, 13 rounds, um, and when the magazine restriction associated with the uh, 1994 U.S. assault weapons ban was put into effect, all those commercial magazines were changed to 10 round variants. Um, and though that has since been repealed and we're back to full size mags, you can still see um, 10 round mags available in some of the banned states, as well as when you purchase these guns on the, uh, on the used market, sometimes you'll see them with 10 round mags in those earlier models. Um, with the success of the initial caliber options for the USP, uh, it was no surprise that in 1995, uh, just two years after the release of the USP, uh, the 45 USP hit the market. And, uh, and learning from the earlier lessons of long-term durability of the higher pressure cartridges, um, the USP 45 is slightly larger in both slide and receiver dimensions than the um, USP 9 and 40. So if I hold this 40 receiver up on top of the 45 receiver, it may not be so easy to tell, but you can see the magazine well down here on the bottom receiver extends down just a little bit further on the USP um, than it, uh, 45 than it does on the 40. Um, as well, the, the slide, the dimensions in width are the same, um, but the length is a little bit um, greater here on the 45 and obviously the mass related to it. Internally, obviously, your uh, recoil spring, your barrel, your extractor, um, those are all going to be different, um, but all of the other fire control pieces inside the weapon are the same between the, uh, the 45 and the, the 9 and 40 variants. And we'll see those carry over to all the other follow-on models of the USP series as well. Um, but uh, the main difference that we'll notice between the 40 and the 45 is that on the 45s, they went back to a metal design. Um, so all the other um, variants we'll see that'll come after will go to steel, 
Um, it's been the same thing with the follow-on models after the USP series have gone to steel. It's just those two, the 9 and 40 full size, that have remained uh, to be uh, polymer ones. And, uh, and really kind of nice for uh, this size pistol, the 45 is a 12 round mag capacity. Um, that, was, that was a little more than usual um, at, the, at the time and it still uh, gives you a lot of capacity in a, in a large size weapon. Uh, the following year in 1996, uh, responding to contracts requesting an off-duty detective size USP, HK released the USP Compact, again in uh, 9 and 40 first, and then following in uh, 45. Uh, USP 9C was offered with uh, 13 round steel magazines in uh, 9 millimeter, uh, 12 rounds in 40, um, and then uh, 8 rounds in uh, 45. Uh, all three magazines were steel uh, in order to uh, reduce the overall uh, uh, impact when, uh, when dropped for strength. And then uh, the pinky extensions, both uh, this one here, you can see an extended one. They also made a flat base. Uh, these came with a rubber style um, base pad, whereas the earlier models uh, were plastic. Um, as you can see here, the uh, the nine millimeter um, model looks very similar to uh, I'm sorry the compact model looks very similar to the full size um, you know dimensionally obviously just a little shorter so uh, your slides the same width um, in the same calibers uh, you can see that increased uh, length on the full size sticking out from there and you can see the grip size is also uh, shorter um, the trigger guards also. Uh, slightly smaller and, uh, and what that resulted with was um, the correspondingly shorter slide and barrel length uh, for the 9 and 40s we had a 3.5 inch barrel uh, with the 45 which 3.7 inch barrel and that was in comparison to the 4.2 inch barrel in the 9 and 40 on the full size and the 4.4 inch barrel on the uh, 45s um, because of the shorter dimensions of the slides and barrels. The uh, USP compacts did not have the same uh, recoil spring rod assembly that we had seen in the full size guns. Um, so again, for a comparison, here's your dual recoil rod assembly that we see in all the uh, USP full size variants. But if we look here um, inside the slide of a uh, compact, we'll notice that the rounded um, design of the mainspring there is replaced with a flat wire um, spring that's actually um, more resilient. And instead of the secondary buffer spring because of the loss of distance, they've gone with this white polymer buffer. Now this doesn't really do anything to uh, uh, help with recoil mitigation. What it really is, is designed to do is prevent this front tang here of the slide from impacting with this soft portion of, of the uh, receiver as the weapon goes into full recoil. And we've seen this same design carried over to, uh, to the later models of, uh, of HK pistol design. Um, another dimensional change with the uh, compact models was the width of the grips. Um, so um, you'll notice this grip is just slightly more narrow I don't even know if you can see it in this photo, but it's slightly more narrow than the grip of the, uh, the full-size USP models. Um, and that's because with the use of the steel magazines, the steel being stronger, uh, you could reduce the width of the walls of the magazine over the width of the walls of the polymer magazines, which meant you could then reduce the width of the grip itself versus the size of the grip on the full-size. Um, the other uh, interesting feature of the USP 9 and 40 magazines is that uh, they carried this design over. So when they went to the P2000, it uses the exact same model. So if it's a 9mm USP compact, you can put those magazines in a 9mm P2000. If it's the 40, same thing. Um, and that goes as well with uh, a P2000 SK. You know, they came with a flush fit 10 round magazine in 9mm. Um, but you can insert your 13 round USP 
or P2 uh, compact or P2000 magazine, and it'll work as well. It obviously will stick down quite a bit. And this carries over to the P30SK and the VP9SK as well. Uh, also with the receiver on the compacts, you will notice that uh, the trigger guard has been reduced in overall size from the full size, but you can still use, uh, use it effectively with gloved hands. And uh, though the accessory rail is shorter in its overall length, designers made sure that it could also mount uh, the universal tactical light uh, like you had on the full size. Uh, it functions in the same way. Obviously, it's going to extend out uh, a little bit further um, out the front of the weapon, um, but it is usable as well, which is a, a neat feature on all those. Uh, the variants are all the same that we talked about, variant 1 through 10. Um, as well as most of the internal components um, uh, within the weapon system between the full size and the compact models, which obviously makes things much easier um, from a maintain maintainability standpoint as well. Um, but with a, a, a nod for uh, better concealment, um, what you have is a multifunction lever that does not uh, protrude as far out the side. So if I hold these two up, you can see that the USP here on the left sticks out a little bit further uh, than the one on the right. Um, you'll notice the because of the uh, dimensions being shorter on the receiver as well, the slide release um, is just a little bit shorter in length than the full size uh, down here. Um, and then again, for concealability, they changed from uh, what we notice as, or we call a spurred hammer. We've got the notches here, and I can mainly reach up here with my thumb and cock the hammer back. Um, on the um, compact models, they came standard with what is called a bob hammer. So you can see it's now back in the single action mode, but if I decock it, you'll notice now it's much more smooth, and uh, you no longer have the ability to grab it here with your purchase and cock it back. You could only do that if you manually cycle the slide. So again, done for concealability. Now you could use either one of these if you optioned your pistol out and you want the spurred hammer. Uh, it can obviously be set up that way, um, but most of the ones you'll see on the compacts, uh, they're gonna come standard with the, uh, the new bobbed hammer. Uh, markings on the slide. Uh, for the USP Compact will actually say USP Compact, um, but uh, the markings on the, uh, the uh, grip panel will just say USP. Um, and uh, these USP Compacts for several years, as well as the full-size models, were offered both in um, your uh, HE finish, your hostile environment finish, or as well they had uh, stainless models. And those stainless uh, slide models now seem to be uh, highly desirable from the uh, collector market. Um, a lesser known caliber offering for the USP Compact uh, was uh, made in an effort to compete with law enforcement contracts uh, for a compact pistol chambered in the newly popular 357 SIG cartridge. Um, and H&K responded to that challenge by making minor modifications to their USP Compact 40. Um, the noticeable difference being the markings obviously on the slide for the uh, for the caliber, um, and then they changed out the barrel um, and the uh, um, and the magazines for those pistols um, to to work with those cartridges. Uh, you don't see very many of those um, available any, uh, on the open market anymore. They've long since been discontinued by H and K. And again, when they pop up on the uh, on the resale market, those guns uh, usually sell pretty. Uh, Pretty well. Um, I am aware of at least two uh, full-size USPs that were uh, brought into the country in 357 SIG uh, for demo purposes. Um, though those were never put into full production, and you won't find that caliber offering on you know the uh, HK serial number reference chart. Uh, I do know they exist, and and uh, if you're watching this video, you know who you are, and I'm waiting for you, you to give me a call. I got cash in hand. Um, Many of you will also remember um, the popular uh, Fox TV series 24, uh, that Jack Bauer, um, the main character, chose the USP Compact as his go-to pistol for most of the series run, um, only upgrading to the P30 in the final season. And, uh, and through the 90s, with the popularity of the USP, 
and the USP Compact continuing to grow um, beyond the steady sales of on the commercial side, um, so were the contracts within the law enforcement community. Um, as these contracts continued to materialize, there was a desire for an improved double action only system uh, to be realized. And this was uh, in really in, a, in an effort to uh, improve the overall trigger uh, over the standard double action, single action, but also to, to compete against uh, so many other striker fired um, companies offerings uh, for contracts as well. Um, so um, this was developed especially for the uh, U.S. Immigration and Naturalization uh, Service, or what we know as INS, um, to improve that trigger performance, and it quickly became a desired option and helped secure uh, H&K with their largest non-military uh, pistol contract they'd ever received. Um, and that was made up of the USP compacts, um, as well as the new P2000s and P2000SKs. Um, after 2001, uh, the LEM system was offered in the civilian market as well. And as I discussed before, um, I've got a separate video on LEM um, that I've created on my channel, and I encourage you to go watch that. Uh, for brevity, I'm going to eliminate from regurgitating that again here in this video. Um, but before moving on from the USP and the USP Compact to discuss the other models, uh, there's one other noticeable uh, modification um, that was made for a specific law enforcement contract that I wanted to cover, and that is um, one that they did for the Department of Corrections. Now, the Department of Corrections, as you might expect working in prisons, uh, they are always concerned with the threat of one of their uh, officers losing their, their weapon uh, in a riot or other emergency. And so their specific request when they were looking at the USP um, pistols was to have a mag magazine disconnect safety um, installed. And if you're not familiar with what a magazine disconnect safety does is, is when the magazine is in the weapon, it allows the weapon to fire. But if the magazine is removed from the weapon, it will lock, lock the weapon from firing, which would mean that if you had a round in the chamber, but you dumped the magazine, they wouldn't be able to fire uh, that round. Now, we've seen those kind of things uh, in pistols in the past, but they've kind of fallen away from, uh, from some of the more current designs. And H&K designers wanting to respond to this had realized that, hey, the, the quantity of, of this order is not large enough for us to redesign the entire receiver. Uh, so they came up with kind of a stopgap method. And I don't have one of these here to show you uh, because, again, I've never seen one in, in, uh, in use outside of the, those uh, correction units. But what they were able to do was basically create a, uh, a device that fit over the top of the sear and, uh, and between the sear and the hammer. And when the magazine was in place, uh, that spring pressure uh, was, uh, was eased, but when the magazine was released, that spring pressure caused that thing to pop up and it prevented the hammer and the sear activation uh, to work with each other. It would lock the gun in place. Uh, so again, if the officer uh, was in a struggle and thought he was gonna lose his weapon, he could just dump the magazine. Um, and then that, even if there's a loaded round in the chamber, that, uh, that inmate wouldn't be able to fire the weapon at him. Um, now, uh, the good benefit of this design was that it did not um, decrease, or I shouldn't say decrease, it didn't negatively affect the trigger pull of the weapon, whereas we've seen with some other designs, it actually makes the trigger pull either gritty or too heavy. Um, the downside of this system was that it actually created over a long term, more wear on the sear spring, uh, the flat main spring inside the pistol, and you'd see the, the breakage on theirs. Um, so what H&K did, and we'll cover this in the P2000 video, was improve that design into a much better um, thought out um, uh, set of parts um, from the ground up versus an, an afterthought kind of uh, modification they did there. Now, going back to the 1990s and the success of the USP uh, with a desire to continue to market the USP to respond to commercial uh, competition community, H&K released two additional full-size USP models in 1997. Uh, the most notable, uh, obviously, due to its later use in the Lara Croft Tomb Raider film, uh, is the USP Match. 
the match was offered in 9, 40, and 45 uh, with both the hostile environment uh, and the stainless slides. Um, with a focus on accuracy and target shooting, uh, several changes over the standard USP were incorporated. Uh, most obvious on the match was the large uh, 360 gram target weight with its diagonal slots on the bottom. Uh, attaching directly to the accessory rail on the pistol, uh, the upper part of the weight is open in order to facilitate the tipping of the barrel. And that barrel was increased to a length of 5.8 uh, inches. Uh, and learning from the Mark 23 program where maximum accuracy potential was demanded, uh, an O-ring uh, was added to the barrel. Um, as you can see here on this tactical model, um, this O-ring right here that wraps around the barrel in a little recess cut uh, that you'll see there. Um, and, uh, and where it positions itself when the slide is closed is right at that point where the barrel um, would make contact with the front of the slide, okay? And then with the pressures um, exerted during firing of the pistol, uh, that, that O-ring will expand and center the barrel in the slide at the point the bullet leaves the barrel. And this significantly increases the repeatability of the accuracy of the pistol. Um, so it's, it's basically something that previously, um, in order to reach that kind of accuracy standard, you would have to have a match fit, you know, hand fitted type barrel and slide type uh, effect. And now uh, H&K was able to do this through a production pistol um, that was, you know, more mass produced. Um, markings uh, on the pistol remain standard except for the large, uh, slightly angled script of match that you see uh, on the target weight. Um, and then three other notable changes exist in this model from a standard USP. Uh, first, again, for accuracy uh, being increased, uh, the standard three-dot sights were replaced with a uh, tall fixed blade front sight and a windage adjustable um, and elevation adjustable rear blade sight um, from an Italian company uh, called LPA. Uh, next, the designers focused on smoothing and lightening the trigger pull, and the result is what is uh, known today as the match trigger kit. Uh, this kit, uh, shown here, um, comprises of several internal components that replace the original variants. Uh, you have a lightened trigger return spring, um, a lightened hammer strut spring, as well as a, uh, a lightened and updated catch. Uh, I'm sorry, I light the hammer in an updated catch. Um, the sear spring was nickel coated in order to provide a cleaner break. Uh, and then the most visible uh, part from the outside uh, is the trigger, which incorporated an adjustable trigger shoe, uh, which eliminates the over travel, allowing the shooter to only pull the trigger back far enough to actually release the hammer from the sear, uh, thus reducing the overall reset as well. Uh, later, H&K offered these parts as a conversion kit, um, and it remains one of the most common and easily, um, and most importantly, uh, factory-approved ways to improve the performance of your uh, USP um, full-size variant. Uh, lastly, the match uh, was the first model to be offered with the ambidextrous multifunction lever, effectively creating a ver variant one and two for left-handed and right-handed shooters. Um, the uh, USP match was offered in uh, both a padded carrying case as well as an uh, aluminum briefcase with a foam cutout. And we'll see other special models of the USP being offered with these uh, cases as well for several years. Um, unfortunately for the HK enthusiasts, the USP match was discontinued in 1999. And as you can expect with just a short production run, um, these pistols now demand stupid prices uh, within the uh, collector community. And the, the reason you don't see one here on my workbench to show you today is because I sold mine many years ago when I received such an offer as well. Um, but it is a very, very cool gun. And if you can get one in your collection, it's, it's definitely one to have. Um, very accurate as well. Um, at the same time as the uh, USP match was released, uh, H&K offered a lower price offering uh, called the Custom Sport, uh, which as you can see is outfitted similarly, um, but without the longer barrel and match target weight. 
Um, there's no special markings uh, made on this pistol. Um, it just looks like a uh, like a standard USP. Um, but with the uh, the match trigger kit, the uh, the raised sights, adjustable sights, and the uh, the match O-ring barrel, uh, this pistol was offered in uh, in all three calibers as well. Um, it's been uh, produced for a much greater time, and in fact, at the time of this video creation, it's still available on the uh, HUK Germany website. But it's not been imported uh, for sale through HK uh, USA for quite some time. Um, here you can see a recent production example um, by the date code there, um, but it's imported through another U.S. Uh, importer. Um, the next USP model, uh, also aimed at the competition market, uh, debuted a year later in 1998, and that was aimed specifically to fit within the maximum size restrictions uh, for handgun uh, in the International Practical Shooting Confederation, or, or IPSC. Uh, and that's where the USP export, Expert um, is basically an updated version of the uh, custom sport in order to take advantage of those additional um, millimeters of space um, within those size restrictions. Uh, again, this was offered in all three calibers, uh, and it incorporated a match barrel uh, with its unique O-ring, but now the barrel was lengthened um, to 5.2 inches along with the recoil spring assembly and the slide. Uh, so you can see, obviously I've got a tactical here, um, but it's got a standard slide. If I put these two together, we can now see that the receivers are the same, but the slide um, will stick out significantly further than a standard uh, USP would um, as well. Uh, this also incorporates the same uh, style LPA raised blade on the front and uh, adjustable um, blade on the rear. Uh, but what you'll notice here is that they've actually cut um, and recessed the rear sight um, in lower uh, on, the, on the front and back um, than you would on the, uh, on the match and the custom sport where they sit uh, a little higher. And that was done again from an overall uh, sizing uh, capacity for the uh, restrictions within that uh, confines. Has the match trigger kit and it has the ambidextrous multifunction lever. Um, in 45, it's, it's offered the same 12 round magazines, um, but in 9 and 40, um, you could offer that with um, a new part called the Jet Funnel Kit, um, where again, designers were able to take advantage of those additional length uh, allowable within uh, IPSC. And, uh, and this kit, which could came standard on the Expert 9 and 40, um, but could be ordered separately, uh, consisted of the wider magazine well, uh, a replacement for the lanyard loop with a different mounting pin, um, but most importantly, uh, new extended magazines. Uh, the 9mm received a bump to 18 rounds, and the 40 was increased to 16 rounds. Uh, initially, these magazines were of a semi-translucent polymer construction with steel base plates, um, and uh, steel inserts in the feed lip area to give them um, rigidity. Um, but later, in order to increase the strength of the magazines, and uh, they were changed to steel, uh, obviously the added benefit is that the increased weight uh, helped ensure that these magazines fell freely uh, more rapidly during those speedy magazine changes that are used in, uh, in competition. As you can see here on the left, the standard 15-round uh, polymer magazine uh, for the USP then in the center, the original polymer jet funnel, 18 round, nine millimeter magazine. And then on the right, the uh, later updated steel jet funnel, 18 round magazine um, for the nine millimeter as well. Um, as shown here, H&K Germany also offers an expert conversion kit, uh, which allows the drop in of the expert slide assembly, the barrel uh, recoil spring assembly and slide onto any standard um, frame USP um, for, uh, uh, for you to use that. So if you had a, say a nine millimeter USP um, full size and you wanna drop that expert on there and take it to the range and compete, but then swap it back and, and turn it into a, a carry gun or home defense, um, you could do that. Um, this is not presently available through HK USA, but you'll see these uh, through some of the other importers uh, occasionally as well. Um, with the USP match out of production, 
Uh, there became a demand for another target-focused pistol that the USP expert uh, apparently didn't um, satisfactory fill. Uh, they wanted a longer barrel uh, to be the focus, and the solution was found in the USP Elite. Um, the USP Elite is offered in uh, in only two of the usual calibers, though. Uh, it's offered in 9 and 45, uh, but not 40. Uh, in the 9, it comes with a jet funnel kit like the Expert does, um, and in the 45, uh, that's not an option. Um, as you can see here, uh, the Elite has uh, the match trigger kit, um, and it also has the ambidextrous selector levers, and it also has the same uh, adjustable LPA sights, but they are not recessed like they are uh, on the uh, on the Expert. They're they're raised again, um, but the uh, besides the marking on the slide there to say Elite, um, the most noticeable difference is the fact that it now has. A, a six inch barrel, a match grade barrel with the O-ring and the ex slide has been extended to 9.25 inches and is hand fitted. And it's got an open area here on the bottom to reduce the, the mass, gives it kind of a shark look. Um, but this is uh, the longest barrel option and one that I, I think is, uh, is pretty cool. Um, another thing that most people don't notice when they first look at it is as you can see here, the top of the slide has been rounded off on the edges, and you can see this long rib section here versus the you know, more blockier confines that we'll see on a on a standard uh, USP slide or like this one here on the on the export. And this is more in, in line with what we saw later with uh, the tapering of the slide for the USP series. Um, so that makes it a little more unique than the other models. Uh, two more limited run competition focused USPs were offered for a short period of time, uh, but these came out of HK USA instead of HK Germany. Um, these were the adaptation of standard USPs and were modified by the gunsmiths in uh, the repair shop. Uh, they were offered in 9 and 40, um, and these USPs uh, were then modified by adding the jet funnel kit, a match trigger kit, and a set of Novak sights. Uh, which used a blacked out um, rear notch and a fiber optic front sight. Um, the first one called the USP Custom Combat uh, was offered in a double action, single action match trigger, while the USP Combat Competition utilized uh, what was termed as the LEM Match Hybrid, a mixture of uh, LEM conversion kit and match uh, trigger kit components in order to create what was thought at the time to be the sweet spot. Um, there were no special markings uh, made on these weapons, and though they were popular, um, because they were not approved by HK Germany, uh, they were rather abruptly pulled from sale here in the US. Um, but if you want to have one, uh, they're relatively simple to build with the correct components. Um, as you can see here with these photos, over the years, certain color options uh, for the receivers have been available for limited times with uh, tan, green, and gray being the three that come to mind. Uh, on, the mo on the subject of colored frames, one of the most rare to see are the red frames. Um, these are training models that will function uh, to simulate a real pistol uh, but are not capable of being fired. Um, a conversion kit was also offered for the USP and USP Compact to fire simulation ammo. Uh, these are identifiable by the blue slides, and these were drop-in kits um, consisting of a lighter slide, recoil spring assembly, and, and a special barrel. Um, so with those covered, let's now move on to the Super Duper Special Operator models. Um, working with uh, the military to respond to requirements, um, you know, H&K had already provided the Mark 23 as part of the uh, U.S. SOCOM uh, Offensive Handgun Weapon System Program. And though it exceeded um, all of those technical spec specifications, um, there was really no getting around its size. And soon we had requests come in for a similar capability, um, but in a smaller package. And so what H&K responded with was by creating the USP Tactical, uh, which as you can see here, um, it's basically a USP uh, custom sport with the uh, match trigger, the ambidextrous 
um, selector levers. This one's just got a, a left side on it instead, um, and a, a match O-ring barrel. Uh, but the, the barrel was now longer and threaded uh, for uh, use with a sound suppressor. Um, and then they added the same type of uh, LPA uh, sights to the top. Uh, markings on the left side of the slide uh, read USP Tactical. And, uh, and it's most often found in 45, uh, but they were also offered in uh, 40. Um, it was offered in nine millimeter for several years, but instead of being called the USP Tactical, it was called the USP 9SD, and it did not come with the match um, barrel. It did not come with the, uh, with the match trigger kit, um, though the barrel was threaded. Um, Later though, production was brought in line with the other USP tactical models, and now you can find it in, in nine millimeter as well. Uh, here in the US, uh, the USP tactical 45 is most often seen with its specific suppressor from Knight's Armament, um, almost identical model to the, uh, the one that CAC made for the Mark 23. On the tactical model, the thread pitch is reversed. Um, it uses a left-hand thread pitch, so it's not the same one. It will not work with the, the Mark 23 and vice versa. Um, and, uh, and because of its success uh, within those roles, it was later offered for sale on the U.S. commercial market and continues to be uh, really kind of the mainstay of the different models, whereas we'll kind of see the experts and elites and other ones kind of come in and out. Uh, the USP Tactical really never seems to leave the, uh, the catalog every year. Um, one note regarding the, uh, the tactical variants um, is, uh, is relating to the recoil spring assembly. So if I take this one apart, I can show you a difference here that most people don't know about. If you look here at these recoil spring assemblies between a standard USP and a tactical variant, on a USP, right here on the back of the recoil spring assembly, you see it's, it's all rounded. There's no markings whatsoever here. But if we look at the tactical model and hold it next to it, you'll notice a small band right here around the back of the recoil spring. And I hope that, hope that shows up clearly and definable in there. Uh, that band represents the fact that the tactical models um, have a stronger uh, recoil uh, spring uh, assembly than uh, the standard models, and that's associated with uh, the fact that they're expected to shoot uh, suppressed ammo with higher pressures. Uh, those same recoil rod assemblies are in all of the uh, other special models, the Expert uh, and the Elites uh, as well, and that's associated with the, uh, the heavier, longer uh, slides and barrels on those as well. So I mentioned that. Uh, because it's important, because I see a lot of customers um, that um, are working with me who have taken a standard USP and they have um, gone and added either the HK factory barrel, uh, threaded barrel option that you can buy as an accessory uh, to, their, uh, to their standard USP, or they bought some aftermarket type threaded barrel and added to their USP, but they didn't know that they needed to change out um, the uh, recoil rod assembly and what can happen at that point obviously is you're imparting more pressures on the on the gun than it should be you're going to lead to increased wear and you can have other problems with uh with parts breakage as well so you want to make sure you have those things taken care of if you can uh, even with the presentation of the usp tactical there were still requirements coming from certain u.s special operations units uh, for an even smaller capability and h &K responded with the USPCT or Compact Tactical. Uh, this pistol was offered in 45 um, and was a compact model uh, with no special markings on the slide, um, but it did have taller uh, suppressor sights uh, from Heine uh, that were an option in order to uh, see over the uh, suppressor. And CAC had designed a special compact variant suppressor specifically for this pistol. Um, to reduce the overall length and still maintain the necessary sound suppression, a unique proprietary section of wipes was used uh, in the section just before the traditional baffles, um, long since discontinued. A pistol with, uh, with this suppressor is now highly collectible, as you might expect.
um, though purchased in small numbers, it was not uh, until the design was further updated to the soon to follow HK45 series uh, that the HK45 compact, um, uh, that there was a larger adoption within US SOCOM made, uh, gaining the distinction of Mark 24. Uh, in the US, a couple of uh, other special models were created uh, for the USB compacts, uh, which as you might suspect, have also become very collectible. Uh, the first of which was the H&K Anniversary Commemorative. Uh, this was offered in 1999 in the form of a USB Compact 45 uh, to recognize the 50th anniversary of, of H&K as a company. Uh, it was presented in a fine wooden display case with a black outer cardboard box that had a raised red H&K logo. Uh, and that case held the pistol, uh, a spare mag, and then a special commemorative coin. Um, identifiable from a standard USP Compact 45, the slide on this commemorative model um, has a high gloss blued finish. Uh, and both the special emblem, which is the same that's on the commemorative coin, and the words uh, 50th anniversary one of 1000 laser etched on the side. Um, it also came with a special certificate. Uh, the second special model was the special H&K International Training Division commemorative pistol, uh, which was a USP Compact 40 in LEM. Um, the subject of the ITD is well worth discussing in greater detail, but I'll leave that for a later video. Um, this pistol was offered in 2000 as a H&K Anniversary 45, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 40 compact, um, the ITD pistol uh, came in that same uh, wooden case uh, with the uh, spare magazine and a special ITD challenge coin, or as the advertisement showed, a bronze medallion. Um, tritium sights were installed, and the slide, again, with a high-gloss blued finish, um, had the H&K ITD logo, uh, and then the outline of the famous Rainbow Six photo uh, laser etched into the left side of the slide. Uh, now that wraps it up with the USP models which uh, were offered through HK USA, but that does not complete all of the USP models available. Uh, so let's cover the four remaining uh, from German service and one other special model. Now the next variant of the USP is actually uh, my personal favorite and that comes from the adoption of uh, that model for the German Armed Forces. Um, and this uh, followed in the late fall of 1994, uh, where um, just like with rifles, uh, the German Armed Forces was, was ready to uh, move on to something new. Um, you know, they were they were pretty much far behind all of the other countries with updating their weapon systems. And when it came to uh, handguns specifically, uh, they were probably one of the oldest. Uh, they were still using um, the Walther P38 design in the, uh, in the P1, you know, all the way up until the 90s. Um, so they were looking for a new semi-automatic, double action, single action, 9 millimeter handgun and it worked out great. Um, H&K was already working with them with uh, what would become the G36, and in the USP design, they already had a, uh, a suitable uh, weapon system uh, to uh, present to them. And, uh, and that uh, is what became known as the P8 um, in uh, German service. Uh, now, the first ones uh, that they saw uh, come into issue were about uh, 60 of them, uh, in the beginning of 1995 that were issued to uh, the Kampfschwimmer Company, uh, which are their combat divers for their version of the Navy SEALs. Uh, there's a picture of it here of one of those initial uh, models. And what you can see here is that this one has uh, the uh, special maritime uh, coating uh, finish on there that they had designed um, at the request of the Navy SEALs back in the 80s. Um, which they put on the MP5 series um, guns, MP5 Navy guns that the uh, Navy SEALs had been issued. And because these were going to the uh, comp swimmer, they put them on these pistols as well. There was a different finish that went on the, uh, the standard guns that would follow 
uh, and that finish is, was more akin to what we saw on the commercial um, USP models like this uh, USP 40 year. Obviously this one's uh, a well-worn, well-used one, um, but it was their hostile environment uh, type finish that you'd see there. Um, after those initial 60 um, were issued, uh, then we saw uh, just under 200 uh, be sent to the newly formed KSK, which is the German version of um, you know, Delta Force uh, here in the U.S. Um, and then they started with a large-scale order um, to the rest of the German uh, military, which first went to their Air Force for about 14,186. Um, of those, 350 went to the Air Force. The Navy received uh, 250. Um, the rest went to the, uh, to the Army. And, uh, and then another uh, large-scale order of another 20,000 um, came uh, after that. And then um, those were split up between the uh, Army and the Air Force uh, as well. And there had been, you know, continued follow-on orders of those pistols uh, throughout the 90s into the 2000s as they continue to uh, to replace other pistols in the line. Now, the big question for a lot of people is, uh, you know, why don't we see the P8 available here in the U.S. from H and K? And that's a that's a tough answer. They they've never imported it um, as a company. Uh, the ones that uh, that get into the country, like the ones you'll see here, um, are done through other importation um, avenues. And, uh, and they're very rare in the country, especially in new condition. They're, you'll see some that pop up on Gun Broker every once in a while that are, uh, are actual um, you know, uh, used guns from, from Europe that uh, have come in uh, to the country, um, but brand new ones are a little harder to find. Um, and this one here is, is an original P8. Now this one with a BF date code is, is much later in the production run than the new, um, original style, and it has a different um, finish on it uh, than you see on the original uh, P8s that were issued. Um, this is also a different finish than what you see on um, you know, the standard uh, pistols today. It's a, it's a thicker, um, dark black uh, coating on there. Um, the next big thing that people ask is um, why or what is different about uh, the, uh, the P8 than the USP series. Um, the obvious things are the markings. You know, here on the slide, it says P8. On the receiver, it says P8. We're on a USP. It'll say USP on the uh, slide and on the receiver. The original USPs had a PAT number. Now the newer ones will say USP on the right side. Um, on this one, it still has the, uh, the PAT number on the right side. So externally, from a marking standpoint, uh, that's what you'll have. Um, the ones that were made for commercial uh, sale will have all of the, uh, the date code markings, serial number here on this bottom portion of the slide. Um, the actual military issue ones uh, will have it up here um, between the uh, model designation and the, uh, and the caliber. Uh, the other most noticeable difference on these guns is the uh, the multifunction lever uh, and how it works with the pistol. Okay, as you see with the original USP design, uh, you'll have the multifunction lever with the little white mark here on the on the back of the receiver, and then the S and F um, markings for safe being up and fire um, being the central position with decopter all the way down for variant one gun. Um, but on the P8. What you'll notice is that fire is actually in the center position, just like it is on the uh, standard USP, but safe is down. There is no up position. So safe is down, fire is up, decock is still all the way down. So they've kind of reversed the way that works. And you might ask yourself, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they just stick with uh, the original USP design? And that comes from the weapon they were transitioning from. Uh, so here's an example of a P38 uh, in German military use. It was called the P1. It's the same gun, uh, just updated. Uh, the P1 has a uh, 
has aluminum receiver instead of steel receiver like this, but pretty much the same weapon from World War II. And as you'll see, its selector, um, though mounted up on the slide instead of on the receiver, um, fire is up and safe is down, just like we have here. So I would put the safety down. If I wanted to fire the weapon, I would pop the safety up. So that was the reason from a standpoint of training that they wanted to, uh, to have the uh, multifunction lever, the safety device um, like that. Um, and it gets some gripes from uh, US owners uh, from that design, they don't like it, and it's just because it's different from what they know. On the other ones, um, for me personally, it doesn't doesn't phase me at all. Um, you know, on a double action, single action gun, I don't run uh, the safety as a secondary device. I use the double action trigger as my safety device, so it's already in the standard fire position, just like it would be on the uh, on the USP. It doesn't phase me. Uh, I can retrain around different weapons if I need to. Even if I wanted to carry this, it's not that different a, uh, a system for me. Uh, the only thing that is a little strange um, is that um, if you use the decocker and you drop the hammer, it's going to go back to safe, and you'll have to manually swip it back to fire when you're done. Whereas on the uh, on the USP design, fire here. If I go to decocker, I let it go. It goes back to fire. Um, so. Um, those are the noticeable, um, you know, physical differences on there. And then the magazine. Um, on the magazines for the P8, they came in a translucent, or I guess I should say semi-translucent design. Still polymer, like the 9mm USP mags, um, but these um, the, were, uh, were specifically outfitted for them so that they can see the rounds. So when these are loaded, um, you can see bullets inside. Um, you won't be able to physically tell. There aren't um, the witness marks with numbers on the back like there are for standard USP mag. So just visibly looking, I can't say, oh, there's only five rounds left. I mean, if I really wanted to take the time, I could count them with my finger or something, but you can definitely tell whether it's loaded or it's unloaded. Um, and these are a neat feature that you just only saw um, with the P8 series. Um, and then the last uh, main difference on the the P8 versus uh, the other guns um, is the fact that these have the traditional lands and groove um, barrel uh, versus the polygonal barrels that you saw in the other ones. And as I already mentioned on the USP design, you know that first year, year and a half until uh, November of '94. Um, the original USP 9s and 40s all had the lands and cruise barrels, and then they went and transitioned to polygonal. That's what we've seen ever since. Uh, because these pistols were originally um, presented for testing and adopted when the lands and cruise barrels were being uh, used, that's what they got, even though they transitioned afterwards, they never made the change on that. Um, so we've seen these pistols in service uh, for a long time, and they were later, um, uh, adopted a updated model, the P8A1. And as you see here with this example, um, it looks just like a P8. Um, this one here, the P8 is a BF date code. This one is a BH date code. So they're not, these two examples aren't too far from each other. You'll notice the HK marking here, um, this one's just a roll mark, whereas the original P8, you can see it's a roll mark. It's a laser engraved, what kind of white outline. Uh, that's the main uh, visual difference other than uh, the additional A1 marking that you have there and there. And this one does not have the patent code. It's just blank on the other side. Um, the finish being the same is because they had already made a switch to this type of finish um, prior to... Uh, to the adoption of the P8A1 itself in these later model P8s. Um, and the other main visual difference from the outside is the fact the original guns had white dot sights, whereas the P8A1, uh, they come with this uh, luminous um, dot sighting system. So this is not tritium. There is no radioactive uh, nature to this uh, because that's not something that, uh, that is really allowable in, in Europe, specifically Germany. 
Um, this is a design that will gather ambient light for a period of time and hold it, and then it'll, it'll go dark again. Um, so it's better than uh, white dots, obviously not as good as, as tritium, and we've seen that on all of the newer HKs as the standard sites now. Um, the other difference in the P8A1 over the original P8s is on the inside of the slide, if I took this apart, um, there's a reinforcement area just uh, to the side of the breech face um, that helped um, prevent cracking in that area with the really hot uh, 9mm ammunition that the uh, German military uses. Uh, but that's the P8 and P8A1. And, uh, and normally, if you look at pictures of the uh, German military using these guns, definitely through the, uh, through the 90s, you'll usually see it with uh, the universal tactical light um, attached to the gun. Um, as the, uh, the main one, nowadays, you'll see different lighting systems, more updated um, lights on there. And, uh, and here's a picture of a very well-worn P8A1 in use with a the German military, and you can see again that uh, even with this newer, uh, more protective finish, just with uh, extensive use, uh, it'll it'll wear and come to what I think is a pretty cool uh, patina look. Now, with the adoption of the P8 for use with the uh, German Arms Forces and shipments arriving beginning in 1995, um, as well as the release of the USP Compact that in that same year. There was also interest from the German federal and state police forces for a new compact 9mm handgun. And in July of 1996, uh, the police staff college at Munster Hiltrop issued uh, its new set of guidelines um, for uh, these pistols. Procurement of handguns for police service uh, requires uh, that testing be completed under the observation of one of the six German proof houses. and. Uh, that all the guidelines are met. And since HK works with the Ulm Proof House, uh, the testing was conducted at Ulm. Uh, the USP Compact 9mm uh, exceeded all the tests and in February 1997 received its certificate. And later that year was approved for adoption with the Federal German Armed Forces Material Command. Uh, since this was the 10th pistol model to receive such adoption, it was given the nomenclature of P10. Uh, I'm still waiting on delivery of my new P10, which uh, I'm very excited about. Um, so I don't have it here to show you all, um, but as you can see from the photos here, uh, it differs from a Variant 1 USP Compact in, in three ways. Uh, first is the obvious markings on the left side of the slide and grip of P10. Uh, next, you'll notice that the multifunction lever uh, does not have the S and F markings. Uh, and there's no corresponding white line on the receiver. Uh, and lastly, you'll notice that the hammer is not the standard bob type that's found on the other USB compact models. Uh, instead, uh, there was a request for this pistol uh, that, it, that they wanted the spurred model uh, from the full-size USP, which allows the operator to manually cock the hammer with his thumb into the single action position. Uh, previously covered, um, with the uh, special commemorative model USB compacts that were released in the U.S., um, there is also one lesser known example that was also released, but for the German market. Uh, again, to commemorate the 50-year anniversary of H&K, a compact model was released, but unlike the USB compact 45, um, uh, the P10 was chosen. Um, referred to as the P10 Jubilee, um, and as you will see, uh, these had an AA date code reflecting 2,000-year uh, production. Um, these, uh, these models differ slightly because they don't have um, the high-gloss black slide. Uh, <clears throat> instead, they use the, uh, the same finish that the uh, standard P10 has. Um, they do have uh, unique engraving markings, though, uh, reflecting its low production run of 1 of 500 um, and then another inscription saying P10 Jubilee, uh, 50 years of Heckler and Koch. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have a suppressed version for the German Special Forces. Uh, though already issued uh, the P8, a uh, request came from uh, the Kampfschwimmer and the KSK for a suppressor-capable handgun for special missions. Uh, the USP Tactical was an obvious choice, 
um, but with the 9 millimeter model requiring subsonic ammunition for optimized sound suppression, uh, the 45 variant was chosen since its ammunition would already be subsonic. And so the USP Tactical was, uh, 45 was tested and then adopted as the P12. Uh, you'll notice that the only difference on the P12 is the marking on the left side of the slide and the grip. <coughs> okay, well, that wraps up the different models and variants of the USP series. And with uh, production running continually since 1993, the USP series still remains one of the most popular models um, due to its rugged reliability and modular nature. And though some of the other special models have uh, been discontinued or come and go yearly uh, for availability, the uh, USP, USP Compact, and uh, the tactical models continue to be the mainstay. Over the years, I've had uh, many opportunities to work with and train with law enforcement agencies who still had USP service pistols um, and uh, even with other elements within their specific agencies transitioning to uh, other replacement handguns, being able to keep those in service. And I think that really speaks volumes of the trust that those officers have in their well-worn uh, USPs. So that brings me to the, the point in the video where I provide you my thoughts on the uh, USP series from an armor and operator perspective. Um, so I'll start by saying that as an armor, I found the USP series to be incredibly reliable. Um, though I see them come across my workbench often, it's usually um, for variant upgrade, uh, like installing a match trigger kit or an LEM conversion or swapping out sights. Uh, repairs are very infrequent, uh, with the only trend issue I've seen being excessive wear leading to breakage of the sear spring uh, through extensive use. Um, obviously, replacing internal springs is a necessary part of any long-term maintenance, uh, but these guns just, uh, they hold up extremely well and are a great choice if you want, you know, that kind of end-of-days gun that you can trust. Uh, even a well-worn police trade-in pistol can be a great purchase um, found at lower prices, often just needing a, a thorough disassembly, cleaning, uh, and spring replacement. Uh, and of course, the modularity of these pistols is one of their greatest strengths, allowing the owner to modify and customize the pistol for their specific and often changing needs. Uh, then from an off operator perspective, uh, I'd say that there's only a few real downsides versus uh, current offerings when you look at a, a USP series pistol. Uh, the first is the overall size, especially the slide. I mean, there's no getting around it being a blocky pistol, um, but you have to remember that this was designed um, to be a duty pistol as in its intended role for law enforcement. Um, and I've been told by several friends who have worked with H&K for years that the first thing uh, that one of the designers will ask when presented with a request for a new firearm design is how long do you want it to last? Um, and the USP is built to last. Uh, from a comparison standpoint, the USP is not really much different in overall size than a SIG P20 or a P226. Um, now I'll agree that for a nine millimeter pistol, you can do better on size than a USP, um, but the 45 variant, it, it's hard to beat uh, for what it uh, brings to the table. The compact's obviously uh, better as a concealed carry option um, if that's your primary focus. Uh, besides the blockiness of the slide, it's really kind of equivalent to a, a Glock 19. Uh, the next point is the proprietary accessory rail. I always hear people whine about. Um, you know, the later model HK45 and P30 series all have the industry standard Picatinny rails now, uh, and the lack of an update on the USP series continues to be a complaint by owners and prospective buyers. Uh, there is an aftermarket mount which allows you um, to uh, put any number of uh, current Picatinny compatible lights uh, on your pistol, uh, but of course that's an additional cost and then acquiring a holster that works with that mount and your light um, would then be become kind of a custom order project. But again, there are companies out there that'll help you with that. Uh, the only other uh, common detractor I, I see is the lack of a grip modularity. Uh, as we've seen with later pistols from H&K and other companies, removable back straps and side panels have now become commonplace, uh, making the grips much more ergonomic and customizable to the specific desires of an owner. 
Um, yet as long as you don't have tiny little carny hands, uh, you should be fine with a USP and definitely with a USP compact. Um, so to summarize those thoughts, uh, I believe that those points are really somewhat minor complaints and they shouldn't dissuade you from adding one or more USP series pistols to your collection as a choice for self-defense, competition use, or just rounding out your collection. Uh, in the pros column, besides the reliability modularity, I think the design leads to uh, this being an incredibly soft recoiling pistol. Uh, I think, of course, you'd expect that from a 9mm of such size, um, <clears throat> but in comparison to competitors, uh, pistols in 40 and 45, again, the USP is really hard to beat in that category. Um, next, you have a wide range of models available, allowing you to have the same muscle memory operation across multiple weapons. Uh, you can have a carry gun, you can have a duty gun, a home defense gun, a competition gun, all that are functionally the same, uh, but with different capabilities. Um, and if you want a suppressor host, again, you know, you, you, you could really do a lot worse than a USP in that category as well. Now, with all that said, I'll freely admit that you know, I'm biased in my appreciation for the USP series. As I mentioned from the beginning of the video, uh, this was the first pistol uh, and h and pistol I ever owned. Um, it's reliable, it's iconic, um, even its look, um, they just appeal to me. And I've never had one fail on me. Um, and that's, I can't say that about a lot of other guns. Um, over the years, I've owned just about every USP model offered. I, I still have several in my collection and I'm getting ready to add a couple more. So yeah, you could say I'm a fan. Um, but as you can see uh, here in my office, uh, you know, I've decorated it with all of my favorite H&K weapons, and I've got a spot for the USP series here as well. Um, I've created this custom frame, which again shows the famous ITD photo of the USP-40, as well as the instructional charts associated with the exploded diagram and operator, operational principles. Uh, and here I have a variation of that original photo done by Dick Kramer, who's responsible for much of the ITD-related art. Uh, and posters and catalogs from during the 90s. Um, with it, I have the frame coins that I earned from attending the courses with ITD while I was still in the Marine Corps. Uh, I also recently received this rare poster, uh, once uh, offered from H&K in the mid-90s, uh, and it's at a frame shop now getting reset, and I'm excited to find a new spot in the office to display it. And, and I thank my new friend for, uh, for sending that to me. Well, that wraps up my video review on the HK USP series. Uh, I thank you guys for joining me and I hope you've enjoyed the video. Uh, I'm confident that you learned more than you knew before about these awesome weapons from H&K. Um, as always, uh, I'm incredibly humbled to be able to share my knowledge and experience with you guys. And if you're looking for um, H&K service and support or just unique uh, training opportunities, give me a shout. That's what I'm here for. Thanks, guys. Take care.